Good morning, church. Good morning. Glad to see you here this morning. As mentioned, it's been a uh, busy weekend and uh, got really cold. I don't know if y'all were expecting that. I would kind of caught me off guard, but uh, we did a little bit of traveling yesterday to see some family and uh, got a lot colder than what we expected. I did not bring my big coat, so I was a little bit colder than I, I should have been. Um, and so I, uh, I'm kind of getting used to this weather. I know that we we kind of bounce back and forth. This is what it's like, right, living in Texas. So uh, somebody had mentioned earlier, I think it was John had mentioned earlier this week, uh, that the Texas weathermen were kind of throwing out high temperatures like Powerball numbers, right? 18, 64, and just, we just kind of go back and forth on uh, what the weather's like. But I'm glad that you're here this morning. Good to see you here this morning. And if you're a visitor with us, we're especially glad that you're with us. We hope we get the chance to meet you afterwards. Now, I'm not going to judge you, but how many of you have seen that movie, Miss Congeniality? Okay. All right. So, it was a popular movie uh, several years ago, a long time ago. And the premise of the movie is Sandra Bullock, it, her character in this movie is an FBI agent. And she is trying to infiltrate the beauty pageant world because there is a report that there is going to be an attempted bombing of this beauty pageant. And so Sandra Bullock, in order to find out the information that she needs, she has to pretend to be one of the contestants in this beauty pageant. And so that's what she does. She goes and she does the whole thing. She pretends to be somebody else. She takes on a fake name and she infiltrates this beauty pageant world, trying to learn the information that she needs to to solve this case. And towards uh, the end of the pageant, when they're having the actual pageant, the the host uh, he goes around. William Shatner is the guy that is the host of this pageant. He he goes around and he says this one question, and he asks all the contestants the same question. He says, "What is the one most important thing our society needs?" And Sandra Bullock's character, when they gets to her turn, she forgets that she's supposed to pretend to be a someone that's in the beauty pageant world. She kind of reverts back to the mind of a cop, of an FBI agent. And so the, this guy asked her, what's the one most important thing our society needs? And she said, well, that would be harsher punishment for parole, if I understand. And she goes, oh, oh, oh. And world peace. <laughs> and that's kind of the joke. And, and they, they're making fun of this. And they put it out in the movie. Every contestant. When they ask this question, what's the one thing that our society needs, most important thing our society needs? Everybody says, world peace. World peace. Well, they go down the line. Every girl says this. We want world peace. This is what we need. Now, this is when we think about this new year and this time of year, maybe you think about that as well, that we would really like things to be more peaceful in our world. We would like things to be more peaceful than they were a year ago. And I think some of us would even settle for the fact that, you know what, we're probably not going to have world peace. I would just like to have peace in my own life, right? And so I want to look at this passage and look at this idea of having peace in our lives. We're going to be in John chapter 14, if you want to turn over there. And we looked at this idea several months ago about peace, but we're going to kind of expand on that and talk about how the gospel itself offers us peace. I will tell you in this passage, this is where Jesus is preparing his apostles for what is to come. He is getting ready. He's just hours away from being handed over and going to a trial and going ultimately to the cross. And so he's giving some final instructions, some final words to the men that have been following him around for three and a half years. And he's left them several clues. He's told them several times, this is what's going to happen. He said, this is what's going to take place. They're on their way to Jerusalem. He says, okay, we're on our way to Jerusalem. Here's what's going to happen. The Son of Man is going to be handed over. He's going to be put to death on a cross. And in one ear and out the other. He tells them this two or three times. They don't, they don't get it. And now they're troubled again because he tells them they're having the Last Supper. It's just hours before he's going to be arrested. He says, I'm leaving. I'm going away. And now you can imagine they are very uh, depressed by this. They're upset by this. Because now Jesus is leaving. It's becoming real. And so he's trying to give them some words of comfort in this section of Scripture. So we're going to start there in John 14 and verse 16. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, He will give you another helper. 
that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home or our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Here's the thing I want us to think about and explore this morning is this idea that the, the gospel offers us peace not only with God, but it also offers us a peace from God. There's a lot of different ways that we can look at this and a lot of different ways we can tackle this subject of peace. The, the word peace in all of its different forms and in different ways that it's used both in the Hebrew language and the Greek language, peace is in our Bible over 300 times. And there's a lot of different usages of that word peace and we're not going to be able to look at all of them this morning. I want to simply point out to you this parts of the peace that reflect and are found in the gospel story. So when we think about the gospel, we have a peace with God, but we also have a peace that he gives us, a peace from God. And so when you think about this word peace, one of the ways that we see this word peace, and the ones that the Jews would have understood, the apostles would have understood, is this word shalom. Now this means complete. It can also mean safe, full, or whole. So when you think about peace, I especially gravitate towards that word safe. When you think about peace, when you think about what Jesus is trying to offer them in this time, when he says, I give you my peace, he's trying to comfort them. He's trying to say, if you will just focus on me, if you will rest in me, you will be safe, you will be whole, you will be complete. Just trust in me. And so we have this idea of peace. And again, this is Jesus right before he's going to the cross. And though he's told them several times, this is what has to take place, this is what's going to take place, this is why we're here, this is why we came to Jerusalem, he has to tell them again. And he says, I'm leaving. And they get pretty upset about this. And so he tells them, here is what I offer you. I offer you my peace. And so he uses a lot of different things, a lot of ways of bringing this up and saying this to them. And so if you go through this section of 14, 15, 16, where he's talking to them, uh, all these chapters. He says here in verse 27, My peace I give to you. Later on in chapter 16, verse 33, he says, You're going to have trouble in this world, but in me you may have peace. And so he sets up this contrast of choose your focus. Choose what you're going to be interested in and where you're going to put your attention. Because you're going to have trouble or you can have peace. And it's all about which one you're going to focus on. He, he promises them both. He says, you're not, your lives are not going to be free from trouble. You're going to have trouble. But in me, you can have peace. So which one would you rather choose? He also says here uh, a couple different times, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. So over and over again, he's trying to give them comfort. He's trying to make them feel at ease and give them this peace and make sure they understand it. They can be okay. They can have this peace. Because he is going to take care of them. And he goes through and he lists several different reasons. And I didn't even put all of them up here. But I'm going to show you just a few of the things that he's going to give them and remind them of. And so he can say, look, here's how you can have my peace. 
Here's your reasons for being able to have this kind of peace that I'm talking about. And so when you go through and look at this, these passages, especially in this chapter, uh, verse 14, chapter 14, he says, Jesus has prepared a place for them. We're familiar with that passage, right? In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. And so he's trying to offer them peace by saying, look, you're in, we have you in mind. I have, a, I have a place prepared for you. Another reason for this peace that he offers is he says, yes, I'm leaving. I'm going away, but I'm going to come back. And so he's trying to reassure them. You're going to see me, and then you're not going to see me, but then I'm going to come again, and you're going to see me again. And so he's letting them know, I'm not going to leave you stranded. I will come back for you. Because why? I've prepared this place for you, and I have to come back and get you to bring you to this place. So he's trying to offer them peace. And he says, you know the way that I'm where I'm going. And I say, well, we don't, what, we don't really know the way. And he says, we have this famous verse where he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. He says, you can come to, the, you come to the Father through me. And so he's giving them all this type of, of reassurance giving them this comfort, trying to console them. And then he goes on and he says, I also am going to give you the helper. We know this is the Holy Spirit. The Greek word there, parakletos, that means to come alongside or comforter, right? And so he's saying, I want you to be comforted. And so what does he do? He says, I'm going to give you the one that is literally called the comforter. I'm going to bring you and give you my spirit. And we know that the spirit has not come yet, because Jesus is still there speaking with them, right? So Jesus says, I have to leave so that I can send you my spirit. And when I do, he will be your advocate. He will be your helper. He will be the comforter. You've got to think about what they're thinking, what they're going through during this time. Here's Jesus saying, I'm leaving. I'm going away. All these things I've been trying to tell you, they're about to happen. But yet, here's why you can have peace. And he gives them all these reasons for why they can have peace in him. I think one of the biggest ones, probably the thing that just kind of puts all of this in perspective as far as bringing all these together, is what he says in verse 1 of chapter 14. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. This is the main, main point that he's trying to make here, right? If you look to me, if you trust in me, if you believe in the Father, if you believe in me, you don't have anything to worry about. You can have this peace. Yes, you're going to have trouble. Yes, you're going to go through some ups and downs. And he's trying to get them ready for this. But he says, also, you have the option of choosing my peace. I give you my peace. And here's all the reasons why you can have peace in me. So don't be troubled. Look to me. So we have to think about where our focus is. What gets our attention? You have a choice. Do you have trouble in your life? Absolutely. Do you have problems and things that come up that are, that are issues, negative things? Yes. But do you not also have God's peace? Well, you should if you focus on it. And this is what he's trying to get them to understand. You have all these reasons in which you can experience the peace that I am offering you if you will focus on it. Now, I want to kind of back this train up a little bit and go back to what we've been saying on these different points and look at each one of these because these are things that he is giving the apostles. He's telling them, here's the reasons why you can have peace. But I want you to look at this list that he's giving them. He says that he has prepared a place for them. When we look at this list, are these things not true for us also? For example, Jesus has prepared a place for the apostles. Has he not done that for us? Has he not prepared a place for us? The word that comes to mind, that you're thinking of, heaven. Jesus has prepared a place for us. Should we have peace in that fact? How about this? He's coming back for us. Has he not told us that? Not just coming back for the apostles. Do we not see throughout the New Testament this is the plan that God is coming back to take all of us home? Should that not be a reason for us to have peace? We know the way to where Jesus is. We know how to get there, right? We have this plan of salvation. We understand what it takes. We, the scriptures are clear. You want to be where Jesus is. This is how you do it. 
has he not given us the gift of the, of the Holy Spirit? Yes. When we are baptized, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So all these things, all these reasons that he's giving the apostles and saying, you can have my peace, he's saying to all of us, you have these same reasons. You too can have this peace that God offers. All of the reasons that they have peace are all the reasons that you and I can have peace. As I said, peace is a very uh, can be a very deep study. There's a lot of different ways that we can approach this. A lot of different ways this word is used throughout Scripture. I mentioned that there's over 300 references to the word peace. Most of those, when you go in the Old Testament, you'll see some peace thrown around as, talk, as far as talking about wars and battles, and we have that type of peace. But when we get to the New Testament, most of our peace is talking about a relational thing. The peace that we have with God, or the peace that we can experience, a state of mind, a feeling that we have with God. And so when you get to certain passages, this, I was reminded of this one by Paul in Philippians chapter 4. He says, the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I think we've all been in that type of situation, we can look back on our life, that there's a moment in your life where you felt calm, where you felt at ease, where you felt at peace, and it didn't make any sense to anybody else. From all outward appearances, there's no reason you should have had peace in those moments. There's no reason that you should have been calm, that you should have been trusting. But you were. You were at ease. The world was crumbling down all around you, and yet you had peace. And I like the way that Paul says it. He just says, it surpasses all comprehension. And if the Apostle Paul can't explain it, I'm probably not going to be able to explain it either. There's just some things that we don't understand that are too great for us. He says, it is so great, it surpasses all comprehension. And you know what that's like. You can't explain it either, but you felt it. You understood it. You've been in those situations in life where things were happening to you, and the world was trying to beat you down. And yet you are at peace. Why? Because you had God. The rest of the world didn't understand that because they didn't have God. But you had God. And so you had peace amidst the storm. And so when we think about this idea, the gospel offers us peace with God and a peace from God. And up to this point, I've been really talking about this peace from God, this gift that Jesus has offered. This gift of peace that he's given the apostles, that he's given to us. And so we've looked at a peace from God, and we've really ignored this part about peace with God. And so now that we're towards the end, let me go back to the beginning and tell you about this peace with God, because the gospel offers that as well. And we could go through and look at a lot of different examples of this, I'm just going to give you one verse that puts it very plainly, very succinctly. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. I've told you before that Christianity is the only religion where the hero dies for the villain. No other religion can claim that. Jesus comes and makes peace between us and God through his sacrifice. It is because of the peace that God offers through Jesus that we are able to go from God's enemies to God's children. That's what Paul says we were. He says you were enemies. We don't like to think about that, but that's the reality. You and I were on a one-way road to hell. And if Jesus doesn't intervene, you don't have peace with God. You don't have peace with the Father. You are an enemy of His. And His wrath is going to be displayed in response to your sin, the sin of the world. The only hope you have is if someone stands in the way of that and substitutes for you and is able to make peace in that relationship with God where you cannot. So this is what Jesus does in the gospel. 
Yes, we have this wonderful gift for, of peace that he gives us as Christians. But before even that happens, before we even have a, have, have a hope of having that type of peace, he gives us a different kind of peace. And that is peace with God. We go from being God's enemies to being God's children through the cross. Some things I want us to think about as far as putting this into practice in our lives. Focus on God instead of the problems of the world. Jesus tells the apostles very clearly, you're going to have trouble, but you can also have peace. Which one would you rather have? Which one would you rather focus on? And so we have a choice to change our focus to God instead of our problems. We also need to give, give thanks to Jesus for providing peace between us and God. As I said, we don't have a shot. Paul says in other places that we were without God, that we were without hope. It is only because of Jesus that we are at peace with God. So we were fighting this war. We were going through this war where we are enemies with God. We are destined for hell. And the only thing that can save us is this peace. So now Jesus is no longer, God is no longer after us. He's no longer going to display his wrath upon us. We have forgiveness of sins. That's only through Jesus. And we need to be thankful that he has done that for you and for me. Because you and I know that none of us are deserving of that. Also, we need to point others to the true source of peace. I mentioned that there's been times in your life where maybe you've displayed peace or you've seen the results of peace. And you couldn't explain it. You didn't understand it. But I will tell you that there's people in your life that probably took notice of it. And we need to use those moments. We need to leverage those moments. And when people see us... Going, wow, how in the world are you able to keep it together, man? If anybody else was going through what you're going through, they would just be in shambles. They'd be in pieces. But you seem to have it together. What's the secret? We need to be able to point people to the true source of peace. We may never attain world peace, but we can have peace in our own lives. We can have this gift of peace that Jesus offers us. And so when you think about our relationship with God, when you think about the gospel story, this idea of peace, it starts our relationship with God, and it also sustains our relationship with God. And so he offers, Jesus offers the apostles this peace because he knows they're going to go through hard times. He knows they're going to go through trouble. And so it is this peace that helps us to persevere. And we have that as Christians. We have this gift of peace that despite everything that's going on, we can keep moving forward. As tough as it may be, we can keep going because we have the peace of God. So it absolutely sustains us, keeps us going, right? But it also starts and initiates our relationship with God. Without the peace of God, you and I don't have a, ch have a shot of being His children. We don't have a relationship with Him. And so when we think about this story, when we think about the gospel, we say, well, the gospel is a story of forgiveness. Yes, it is. The gospel is a story of love. Absolutely. The gospel is a story of redemption or reconciliation. You can say yes to all those things. But the gospel is also a gospel of peace. Because without peace, without the peace that comes from God, we would not be able to have a relationship with Him. We would not be able to experience this peace that keeps us going. So the gospel offers us not only peace with God, but a peace from God. So I just want to simply challenge you this week. Let us lean on and rest in the peace that God offers. This peace that surpasses all comprehension. Let's be people who rest in His peace. This week. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time to come and praise you, to enjoy this fellowship, to understand that we are your children, that you've called each of us to be a part of your family. We thank you for the opportunity to sing praises to you, to give you the glory and the honor that only you deserve. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, to sit around and, and take these emblems that re remind us of the great cost, the great sacrifice. And we know that it is through that sacrifice that we were able to be at peace with you when previously we were at war. Father, we did not always choose your ways. We were not always looking to you and your will. In many ways, we were your enemies. 
But we understand and appreciate the fact that through Jesus, we have peace with you. We also understand that you have given us peace to continue to keep us moving, to keep us going, to help us persevere. We thank you for this gift of peace that you have given us. And we ask that you would help us this week to be people who lean into and rely on the peace that you offer. Father, help us to be examples to others this week that they may see how we conduct our lives, how we live our lives, and that they too may want the peace that only you can offer. We thank you for Jesus, and it's through his name that we pray. Amen.